Okay, good morning everybody. Martin Steinert, Stanford University Center for Design Research. I would like to introduce you today a little bit on how to hunt for the next big idea. Just for the wording, when I'm using the word design, I'm talking about engineering design. So I'm not talking about art design, but engineering design. We are solidly embedded in the School of Engineering, Mechanical Engineering. What are we doing usually? Usually we start out with a challenge. Typical kind of challenge would be something like this, you know, a car company comes up to us and says, hey guys, why don't you redesign the open air experience? In this particular case, we interpreted this challenge as, let's get away with this backdraft. Let's eliminate the backdraft from the convertible. Okay, easy enough. What can we do? Well, we can run a couple of analysis, we can run a couple of simulations. We can make basically quantitative engineering. Good. What else can we do? Well, we can become a little bit more creative. We can start to base on design and artistry. We can try to think outside of the box. I'm not exactly sure if you can see what this is. It's a little toy BMW which we put into water. Big advantage. We're doing the same thing here. We don't flow analysis. One is simulated, and one is just sort of rigged up. The big difference is, is this is highly exact and super difficult to change, and I might be completely off track. And this is super easy to change, super easy to adapt and try out a new idea, and is fair enough, rough enough for us to actually get some good insights. All right. So we did solve the problem. No, no big issue, OK? It took us nine months. Very easy, we got a little hole inside the car, we got a mid-slipstream, and this mid-slipstream catches the side streams of the backdraft. And in effect, it actually eliminates the backdraft. Final product, we ship this one to a car company. You know, you have a nice car with a little hole in the middle. So yes, we did solve the problem. Okay, agreed, we, we, we sort of created a new problem. <laughs> But that's okay, we're doing design, that's, that's completely okay, that's our job. And of course you can re-engineer this a little bit so that you get away with this, with, this, with this hole. The question is, I just showed you a very quantitative approach and a very qualitative approach on how to address this kind of question. Now how do we teach that to our engineering students? How do I teach you basically to act, well, almost schizophrenic? Five minutes I'm asking you to be an artist, to come up with new ideas, to be extremely creative, to think outside of the box. And the next five minutes, I'm asking you to be super quantitative, objective, analytical. How do we do that? And this is the thing where I would like to introduce you to our hunter model. We got tons of little exercises, tools, methods, and we also work with analogies. We work with models. And this is actually a very powerful one which I would like to share with you. When I went to university, we learned process models. Standard kind of, you know, A, B, C, and then we got more creative. We actually got a, a slight waterfall kind of model. And then we said we got to learn, so we built in one heuristic loop. Not two, one is enough, enough learning. So, so that's sort of kind of thing what we, what we got. Let's look at it from a completely different perspective. In reality, what we are asking the engineers, the students to do, is to hunt for a new idea. What does it mean to hunt? How do you go out for hunting? Let's assume you are in a little northern Californian little tribe here, a village, and you are sent out to hunt for some food. You go out hunting reindeer. I have no idea where's reindeer here close by, but anyways. <laughs> so the first thing you're going to do is, well, you're going to get a hunting party together. You will not go out hunting alone. So first rule, never hunt alone. Design, engineering, product development is a team sport. It's not, it's not a thing you can do by yourself. And if you get your team together, you, of course, you're trying to find all kinds of different skills. You're trying to find different, different behaviors. You find, you find different knowledge bases. You try to combine into your team. So your team is, is very adaptive and, and very creative in what they're trying to do. So never hunt alone. Get an interesting team together. And then? You know, last year when we went out hunting, the reindeers were here at B. We are here at A. So 
obviously, theoretically, we would just go back to B, get our reindeer and bring it back home. Unfortunately, we are hunting the next big idea and our reindeers tend to move. So <laughs> we are pretty sure that our reindeers are not going to be where they were last year. So instead of going straight to B, why don't we just start out a little bit? Okay, we make a little move. Today it's really raining, so we can't really see the tracks. Things have changed since last year. So we make a stop and make a 360 degree. We look around. We get a feel for what's going on. We try to understand how the circumstances today, how is the environment today. Okay, we decide the straight way doesn't feel good anymore. Let's pivot a little bit to the left and keep on going. We take our next move, and again, we wait. We do a 360 degree analysis. We try to understand how the situation is. We make a decision and keep on going. We start to go onto the hunt. We tag along. And then we understand it. OK, we are pretty sure the reindeers move from B to B here. OK, good. So we tag along into this direction. And then somebody had a big idea. Never go home prematurely. What if we don't bring home a reindeer? Weren't there salmon in the river close by? Much more food? Much easier to get? Something completely different? Let's do a dark horse prototype. Let's make a big abduction. So we make a big kick out and we go all the way low here and we do another 360 degrees. So we rethink the question. We rethink the solution space. We try to understand in how many ways we can actually define the problem and how many ways can we address the design challenge? How many ways can we go about it and bring something interesting back home? And then we narrow it down. We realized, yes, this is a good thing. And at some point, we are engineering designers. This point is usually when time is running out and money is running out. <laughs> at this point, we are closing in. We are setting the requirements. We are building out a prototype. And then we bring, it, we bring it back home. We transport it back home to our village. So what we're doing is we are becoming from a hunter, we are then more becoming some kind of transport person. We are executing. Those are two different, complete different kinds of skills. So on a meta level, it's a completely different kind of skill set and or identity you will use, but also on a micro level. Let me show you. In fact, what we do at every step when we do a little tag is, first, we are generating possibilities. It's called, in our terminology, divergence. We are asking in how many ways can something be done? How many possibilities are out there? Be creative. There's no rules, nothing that could, that, could, that could block you. Really, have an open mind, get ideas. You can call it brainstorming, body storming, whatever. It doesn't really matter. Be, be, be divergent. And then, in order to decide which tech to go for the next one, we are switching over into the convergent mode. We become analytical. We are back. We are changing from becoming artists. We are back into becoming engineers. So we are trying to find objective criteria. We quantify them. We measure them. We identify the best solution and choose this one and go to the next tag. And this is an iteration. This is a cycle. This is an iterative learning process. And the more often we do this, the more of those cycles we run through, the faster we are actually learning. So we try to do this on a very kind of rough and easy level, not, not a lot of investment, not spend a lot of time, learn as fast as you can. Switch between divergent, very artistic, convergent, analytical. What's the 10 cents I would like to give to you? If you try to go to hunt for the next big idea, think about pivoting. Think about pivoting your identity. Play with your identity, with your goals. Be aware that there are different kinds of behaviors. I have a different behavior when I'm more an artist in divergence mode than when I'm in convergence mode. There are different kinds of rules. In brainstorming, you're not allowed to criticize. In a convergent mode, when you analyze, you just discard things which are clearly, clearly inferior. Think about changing space. We found out that space is really important. There are certain spaces that promote creativity. And it really does work. This is our loft. This is our, our little kingdom at Stanford where we, where we teach. This is a different kind of space. That's our research observatory. We could ask the same question in the same space. You will have different kinds of results. So just by changing space, you can induce 
different behaviors. Think about your methods. There are different kinds of sets of methods. So really try to pivot from the divergence person to the convergence person, back and forth, back and forth. And eventually, with a little bit of luck, you will hunt down the next big idea. <laughs> to give you the critical point or the most critical tool in this particular case, Sushi Suzuki at the time, he decided to drill a hole into the toy car. And he found out, to, to all our amazing, if you do drill a hole in there, it really does take away the entire backdraft on a convertible. As you can see, we tested it in real size. That was slightly more difficult for the teaching team to accept that we were allowed to cut open the car, but um, it does work. So I would like to invite you all, be aware that sometimes you're the hunter, sometimes you're the gatherer, and be consciously pivoting your identity in both areas. Before I finish, I have to give kudos. I'm a researcher, I have to give kudos on credits. First of all, to hundreds of ME310 students, they are genius. They are the guys who are actually building the stuff, who are making everything possible. I have to give kudos to generations of researchers at the Center for Design Research, past, present, and future. They are giants. We can stand on their shoulders, broad shoulders. And last but not least, I have to mention Larry, Larry Leifer. He's our director. He is he's the guy who's letting us do such crazy things. Larry, if you see this, you're a legend, famous and infamous. Thank you very much.